Welcome to TalkCast, and ostensibly this is part two of my discussion of Chapter 7 of The Fabric of Reality, A Conversation About Justification. But I'm not actually going to get to any readings from that chapter today. This is just an indulgence for me. It's going to be readings from Karl Popper's book, Realism and the Aim of Science, which was a postscript to the logic of scientific discovery. And the reason I'm going through that before I get to, which should be released soon after this, the actual discussion of Chapter 7, Part 2 of Chapter 7, a conversation about justification from the fabric of reality, the reason I'm doing this is just because there is a lot of content in that chapter there that echoes what Popper says in this book, Realism and the Aim of Science, because there is a section there, section four of part one, called corroboration. So I thought it might just be illuminating and fun to go through some of the places where I agree with what Popper is saying and then where I disagree with what Popper is saying. And then we can see how David Deutsch has improved on Popper and has explained what Popper was trying to get at in books like this one. This is a 464-page tome all about realism and the aim of science. Because David Deutsch has removed entirely from epistemology, I would suggest, this whole concern about how probable or likely to be true our theories and explanations are. Now, Popper was existing at a time where people really strongly believed in this problem of induction, how we could justify as true or probably true particular theories and reducing science to a large extent to a process of trying to predict the future rather than explain reality. The emphasis of Popper's contemporaries and competitors, even through to today, is to not really understand what explanation is and the role of explanation, let alone the role of prediction, let alone the role of science. They get it all muddled up. And so Popper was trying to escape from the prevailing worldview that he existed within to give us something new. It must have been hard. And I think that this chapter, which is why I want to read just through sections of it, sections of his whole section here called corroboration, you can see him struggling to try and escape from false epistemology, these unhelpful ways of thinking about the project of science. And so what I'm going to do here is just to read through sections of this, and then we'll come back in the next episode to see how David Deutsch has actually improved on things. This chapter, being titled A Conversation About Justification, seems to be to do with words. A conversation is a dialogue that involves words, and the word justification is a term that is used in philosophy. It's a term that I've tried to remove, insofar as possible, from any discussion about epistemology, and we're going to see that I think we can do away with it. I explain this in part one as well, and David Deutsch himself said as much in the recording he made for the introduction to the audiobook version of The Fabric of Reality. Let's just consider a basic question before I get into discussing the chapter proper. And the question is, what are we doing here? I don't just mean right now here in this podcast, I mean in life, in creating knowledge and in science. That is the subject of this episode and this chapter of the book, after all. What's really going on with science? What are we doing when we are doing science? Well, the thing is, we are trying to understand something about the world. But why are we doing that? It always comes back to one central issue, first stated and emphasised by Popper and underlined and promoted by Deutsch. And that issue is, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. It is, we have a problem. It's always, we have a problem. We always have a problem and we want to find a solution to that problem. We want to solve a problem so we can move on to something better. This, in fact, is life. And a small sliver of life is science, for most of us anyway. For some of us, it's considerably most of life. But in science, we have problems, lots of problems. As Popper rightly said of science itself, quote, I think that there is only one way to science, or to philosophy for that matter. 
to meet a problem, to see its beauty and fall in love with it, to get married to it and to live with it happily till death do ye part, unless you should meet another and even more fascinating problem, or unless indeed you should obtain a solution. But even if you do obtain a solution, you may then discover to your delight the existence of a whole family of enchanting, though perhaps difficult, problem children, for whose welfare you may work with a purpose to the end of your days, end quote. Now that quote there is from a book called Realism and the Aim of Science, published in 1996 after Popper's death, but it also served as a postscript to his first book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, a postscript that was published sometime well after the publication of the first edition of The Logic of Scientific Discovery. Notice something missing there when it comes to Popper saying what science is about or what philosophy is about, conspicuous perhaps by its absence. Any mention of the word truth. Science we do not do to find the final truth, and that's why we often don't emphasise it. We are not even finding truth of a kind we can be confident in or certain about or anything like that. But why am I focused on this? The reason is, and the only reason for a chapter like this particular one in the fabric of reality that I am discussing, is that this view of science, insofar as it is known, I think it's poorly understood. And insofar as it is understood, it seems not to be taken very seriously. As for it being taught in some sort of formal way so that people can speak sensibly about the project of science and life more broadly, forget it. We are mired in superstitious thinking to a large extent. All of our knowledge has antecedents, you know, the things that came before, our first attempts, first approximations. Here's a story. Millennia ago, after the dawn of language, people struggling on the plains or in the jungles and struggling to eke out an existence and keep the children in the tribe safe, needed heuristics, rules of thumb. So they invented gods, and the gods knew the truth. The gods had power, and they had possession of the final truth. They knew what would happen and why, probably their whims. But the humans did not. Yet we aspired to the power of the gods because the gods had authority over the seasons, over the weather, over natural events, over everything. We wanted that. So the chiefs of our ancestor tribes and our medicine men and women, those with tribal authority, needed a way to persuade others to do what they were told. Sometimes for good reasons. They knew stuff. They often didn't know why that stuff happened, but they knew that it did happen. Out of this circumstance comes something like the more modern religions that we have. The idea that it is known without doubt and there is no point questioning some revealed truth or other. Only the medicine man or the chief had direct access to the gods and, later on, only the priest or other learned people could read and interpret the holy inerrant book, perhaps. The focus then, there, was on the final ultimate revealed truth and that if people only followed the final ultimate revealed truth, then everything would be fine. Then the disaster or the flood could be averted. After all, the stories tell when you depart from the truth, it's then the disaster comes, the literal flood. Okay, so this is one very superficial, simplistic story of the past and of how we arrive at our folk epistemology today. But what people were up to then, well, there is much that we have inherited in our language and our way of understanding knowledge from then through to today, even in the most modern incantations of epistemology. Popperian epistemology aside, of course. Most especially our folk philosophy and folk epistemology, which I would include most academic versions of these. It is still taught that what we're aiming for is to Find out the truth of the matter. Science on this account, therefore, is a project of finding the once and for all solution, theory or explanation that we can carve into stone and settle the matter, have a final, completed science of something or other. It's a very religious idea. It is the hoped-for state of security and safety and certainty. And along the road to certainty, although we might not be able to quite get there yet, we're almost there and 
we can be very, very confident in what we have found, confident that it is almost true. And with just a little more tinkering, we'll fill in the gaps and we'll have the final answer. Science will come to an end. I mean, here on TalkCast by now, if you've been listening for a while, that all sounds ridiculous. But it still is the prevailing view. There still is an idea that science is almost wrapped up. We've almost found the unification of general relativity and quantum theory, and then we'll be done in physics. And, well, biology? Ah, we're tinkering around the edges with evolution by natural selection. We've already found the unit of selection, the gene. What more is there to understand? Soon we'll cure all diseases. Aging will be over. We'll have artificial general intelligence. And then understanding will come to an end. And perhaps we'll all be unemployed because there'll be no creative work left to do. Now, this is completely the opposite to what the vision of knowledge that Popper and David Deutsch especially has gifted to us. But it's important to keep in mind that this is not the prevailing view. This is countercultural. And sometimes I myself forget it. And then I go headlong into encountering someone or some book or some group of people who reminds me that I am in the tiny minority of people who think something a little bit different. There is an open-ended series of problems before us, and each time we solve a problem, we open up a whole new family of delightful problem children, if you like. I prefer daughter problems (laughs) than problem children. Whatever the case, that quote I read earlier from Realism in the Aim of Science, that book, Realism in the Aim of Science, contains a whole bunch of really interesting chapters, but you can tell in reading it, by Karl Popper, of course, that he is writing for his contemporaries. It's filled with language about certainty and probability. And so I want to read a little bit of it today, just to place perhaps in historical context where the fabric of reality is coming from, what its intellectual ancestor is, so to speak. Realism and the Aim of Science is a 460-something page tome split into two major parts. Chapter four of the first part is called Corroboration. Now, corroboration is also a term I have a little bit of difficulty with. Again, I don't think it's useful, but it is language that is used by other philosophers of science. Popper was not perfect, and as we'll come to, Popper may not have understood Popperian epistemology as well as people today do. Now, if that sounds bizarre to you, we'll come back to it, because David addresses precisely that point in The Fabric of Reality. Popper, for example, focuses very heavily on the role of probability within philosophy, within epistemology. He was trying to understand the importance or the significance of probability. He was wrong about it. That's so what? Everyone's fallible. I am no doubt wrong about a lot (laughs) that I say here on TalkCast. And looking back 200 years from now, people will be saying, look how primitive Brett Hall's view of epistemology was. But as I mentioned in the last episode I did on chapter 7, on a conversation about justification from the fabric of reality, I said that this word justified or justification may have been superfluous to our needs. Another word that crops up throughout the chapter is this idea of corroboration. What is corroboration? Well, in chapter 4 of The Aim of Science, which is from pages 217 all the way through to pages 254, Popper hashes out from all angles the rather obscure debate at the time about the differences between confirmation and corroboration and the role of probability in either of these things. My personal thought is, just to steal my thunder for the end, is it's simply confusing the aim of science as being about primarily prediction rather than explanation. If you focus on explanations, then as I emphasise over and again, You are exceedingly lucky in this world if you have an explanation for a particular phenomena. And if you do have an explanation, you have an explanation. There are no alternatives. And if someone comes along with an alternative, then you do a crucial test, especially in science. A crucial test is an experiment which has an outcome that goes in a particular direction. It has a particular result. And the result will rule out one of those theories. You're extremely lucky to have two theories. It just rarely happens in the history of science. And this is why I come back to trope examples like the competition between Newtonian gravity 
and Einstein's general relativity. This is one of the rare instances where there happened to be two competing theories where we needed to do an experiment to figure out which one could actually explain the results of the experiment and which one couldn't. But for any scientific mystery, it's a mystery by definition because we do not have an explanation of why it is the way it is. Now, it's very hard for me to keep up with all areas of science. So, you know, my focus is on astronomy. And there are a whole bunch of open-ended questions right now. Two of the most prominent open-ended questions are, what is dark matter? Dark matter is the name of a problem. It began as, why is it that spiral galaxies are rotating so fast? They rotate as fast as they do because of how massive they are. This phenomena, that orbiting bodies tend to rotate as fast as the mass inside of the orbiting body, in other words, the Earth goes around the Sun as fast as it does because of the mass of the Sun, applies to everything throughout the universe. It's just a consequence, well, not only of general relativity, which is the explanation of gravity, but even to the predecessor to general relativity, which is Newtonian gravity. Both of them predicted the same thing. The more massive the central body being orbited, the faster the things go that are orbiting it. But here's the thing in modern day cosmology, when you look at galaxies and various other structures, by the way, but let's just concentrate on the spiral galaxies, they rotate too fast. You add up all of the stars and the luminous matter, and you can see all the luminous matter at every single wavelength that's putting out light, light of all different wavelengths, you find that these spiral galaxies are rotating too fast. Where's the mass? We can't see the matter that's accounting for the gravity that's causing these things to spin so fast. We don't know what the answer is. It could be that there's actually missing matter there. That seems to be the prevailing hypothesis, but it's not really an explanatory theory because what is this matter? Another theory is, well, we need to have a new theory of gravity, but no one's got a good theory of gravity so far. People have suggested things, but these theories are ad hoc modifications to existing explanations. And I won't go down the road, but epistemology would say, what is the mechanism? What precisely is it? Is it the curvature of space-time and why is that changing? Why can't we detect it in laboratories here on Earth and so on and so forth? We need a solution to this and we don't have one. And the other thing, of course, is dark energy. No one has any clue what this is. Why is it that not only is the universe expanding, but the rate of the expansion is accelerating? When everything else we know says it should be slowing down perhaps even reversing, but that's not happening. What's driving this accelerating expansion? This is science. This is problem solving. This is where we don't even have an explanation. Forget about having competing explanations. Forget about needing to weight our different explanations and the probabilities of our different explanations and being able to corroborate one or confirm one without being able to confirm the others. No, none of that. We don't even have one. And when we do we have a solution to the problem, which is to say a theory explaining what's going on precisely in terms of things that exist in the universe that perhaps we've never thought of before, some new physical thing that we have to postulate that then we'll know actually exists. Once we have that thing, that will be the explanation. Never mind trying to observe it repeatedly over and over again. It'll be the solution. That's what solves dark matter and dark energy. So anyway, that's what I say science is about. I think that's consistent with what David Deutsch says. And I think it's consistent primarily with what Karl Popper says as well. But as I say, people exist in a historical context. And Popper was debating people who believe something quite different about how science works. They believed in the primacy of observations, that observations were absolutely the be-all and end-all of everything in science. And therefore, predicting that a certain sequence of observations would continue off into the future, or the observations were the thing that showed your theory was true, or probably true in some way. This is what he was trying to debate against, trying to, for the first time, mind you, for the first time, try and stand up against the entire philosophical community of his intellectual peers. One has to be brave to do this kind of thing. And it certainly didn't make him popular. And never mind his Jewish heritage, he struggled to find positions at universities for a while there. And to our great historical shame here in Australia, even we rejected him for an academic post. He went to New Zealand instead and did a lot of good work there. So I say that because he was telling the rest of the philosophical community 
and even scientists. He was saying to them all, in very, very polite terms, you're all fundamentally wrong about how science works. But the way he couched it was in very technical philosophical jargon. Jargon that was the language of the time and the language of the discipline. He had to try and speak their language. So I want to go back to realism and the aim of science. This so-called postscript to the logic of scientific discovery, published a long time after the logic of scientific discovery, and then republished, and the version I have was published in, as I say, 1996, but written by Popper, according to my edition, first published in 1983. Now, to some extent, of course, these are esoteric considerations. It's inside baseball to a certain extent. If you're interested in epistemology, then yeah, absolutely, it's useful to know Popper's broad vision about how knowledge is generated and what the purpose of science is. But if you're really interested in epistemology, then sometimes it can be even more illuminating to figure out exactly what, going all the way back to this, to Popper's words about corroboration, may seem even a little esoteric for me. But there's so much here that speaks across the decades through to today, and you can see is still cutting-edge stuff that people just don't get, people don't understand, people don't appreciate, and the wider academic community could do worse than taking on some of Popper's old works and trying to understand what the great man was saying about how science actually works. So I'm going to pick out just a few excerpts from realism and the aim of science before we get to a conversation on justification. And I'm going to begin with page 222 where Popper wrote, quote, the inductivist philosophy not only attributes authority to science, it also, perhaps quite unwittingly, attributes to science a cautious and indeed timid approach which is entirely foreign to our real procedure. This philosophy in regarding it as the aim of science to attain high probabilities for its theories, implies that science proceeds according to the rule, go as little as possible beyond your evidence E. <laughs> End quote. And skipping a little, and I'll pick it up where Popper says, quote, All this presents a most uninspiring picture of science. A picture, moreover, that does not in the least resemble the original. Indeed, What makes the original so inspiring is its boldness, its boldly conceived hypotheses, boldly submitted to every kind of criticism, to every refutation we can think of, including the most severe test which our imagination may help us to design. It is this boldness which helps us to transcend the limits, narrow at first, of our imagination and of ordinary language, end quote. So that first part there, where this idea from induction kind of says, Don't go too far beyond the evidence. It misses the point. It misses the point. Consider the great grand theories of cosmology, the Big Bang Theory. This idea that the universe in the deep dark past, 13.7 billion years ago, was smaller than an atom. How do we come to this view that the universe we now occupy the universe of stupendous complexity around us and stupendous size and 13.7 billion years in age, how did we come to that? What are the crucial pieces of evidence? Well, it's just light, just different kinds of photons being interpreted. Among the first bits of evidence, really, aside from the dark night sky, but let's not worry about that, were Hubble's explanations of spectra breaking up the light from distant galaxies. And that distant light, when broken up into its spectra, showed spectral lines. So we're looking at spectral lines on photographic plates. And those spectral lines redshifted just a little. And that evidence explained by a Big Bang event, the creation of the entire universe. That is the explanation of those redshifted galaxies. And this is why Popper is saying... We're going well beyond the evidence. We are transcending the limits of our imagination and of ordinary language. Going from spectral lines to the creation of the entire universe, that's pretty stupendous stuff. What was Darwin doing? Looking at tortoises and finches. And what was his explanation about those locally interesting things? That all of life on the planet had evolved over 
hundreds of millions, even billions of years through this process of natural selection, tiny amounts of evidence, and us going well beyond the evidence to conjecture grand explanations about how reality works. That's science, not this process of prediction. Now, in this section that I've just read from, I do have to say, I do disagree with what Popper says in parts of this section, but this is, again, inside baseball. It's important for me to understand that I disagree here, but it doesn't make a substantial difference to Popperian epistemology as a whole. There are often disagreements among Popperians. The great Danny Frederick was a great Popper scholar, and he and I would engage in debates about what the purpose of science or knowledge creation is in general. Danny's perspective was that it wasn't that we were after truth. We were not actually looking for the truth. As he would argue, truth cannot be our epistemic aim. Now, I often took exception to this idea, this way of explaining what we're doing when we create knowledge. Danny was a realist and a Popperian, but I always get worried when people deny the fact that we are after truth. Danny endorsed the idea that truth existed. He just didn't think that this is what we were trying to find. I guess it depends upon the person. Some people might very well be trying to find the truth or find at least some truth sometimes, or perhaps by removing falsity, removing misconception. In that way, they're finding truth. Anyway, I do not want to try and represent Danny's position here. You can look up Danny Frederick and look up the papers that he wrote. But I like to say that what we're doing is, of course, solving problems. And the solution to our problems, our explanations, our theories, must contain truth. And the reason why it must contain truth is because an actual solution, to be a solution, is useful. And it's only useful because it is able to solve the problem, which means it's got something right. And right just means true. So there's something true about that solution, if indeed it's a genuine solution to our problem. So this kind of really splitting hairs about what the purpose of science is at that level, is it about trying to find the truth, trying to find some truth, trying to solve a problem, get something right, create an explanation. All of these are kind of circling the same kind of idea. But what we disagree with the non-Popperians about is that all we're doing in science is trying to make predictions. That's the instrumentalist claim. Or that we're merely telling stories to each other that are nothing but fictional narratives that don't actually connect with objective reality at all. Some people, of course, deny the existence of objective reality or deny the possibility that we can explain objective reality to some extent, to any extent. As realists in the Papirian mold, we think that we are actually explaining aspects of objective reality. And we are getting more or less close to that objective reality as time goes on by refining our explanations by finding perhaps where they fail, in other words, where there's a problem with them, or correcting errors in them and improving them, making progress, sometimes by radically overturning a particular theory and sometimes by incrementally changing some aspects of our understanding of reality. So let me go back to Popper for a moment and to the beginning of this chapter because I've been speaking a lot about probability recently. And so... Perhaps just to satisfy listeners who have often asked me, where do you disagree with Popper? Well, here's a particular place. So I'm going to read from, well, it's called Section 27 and just titled Corroboration, Certainty, Uncertainty and Probability. And Popper writes, quote, I have in the preceding two chapters explored the logical ramifications of the problem of induction. There is another ramification, however, which I have not yet touched on because it is not logically connected to the problem of induction, but it is connected with it by ties that may prove even stronger than logic by the inductive prejudice and by a mistaken solution of the problem of induction, which unfortunately is still widely accepted as valid. I am alluding, of course, to the view that although induction is unable to establish an induced hypothesis with certainty, it is able to do the next best thing. It can attribute to the induced hypothesis some degree of probability and a probability of one 
would be certainty, end quote. So here Popper is saying that that's wrong, that an induced hypothesis cannot even establish as true anything with a degree of probability, which is what many, many people tried to say the solution to induction was. Remember, this problem of induction was, how can we rely on the theories of science if we can't prove them as true? We need some lesser degree of confidence in them. Okay, this was the problem of induction. How do our past observations confer some degree of certainty on the future reliance on a particular theory? Popper keeps going and he writes, quote, This view is radically mistaken, yet it can be supported by a highly persuasive argument. This argument may be presented as follows. The whole problem of induction, the argument runs, clearly arises from the fact that inductive inferences are not valid, which is the same as saying that inductive conclusions do not follow deductively from the inductive premises. But there is no need to get alarmed about this somewhat trite fact, especially as there exists a large and important class of inferences which the conclusion does not strictly follow from the premises. In fact, every deductive inference may be modified so as to yield an inference which is not valid but only more or less valid, or valid to a degree. Take the following example. Here's a valid deductive argument. All men smoke, Jack is a man, therefore Jack smokes. Here is an argument that is valid to a degree. X percent of men smoke, Jack is a man, Therefore, Jack smokes, end quote. Now, I would just interject here and say, well, that's clearly ridiculous. <laughs> it simply doesn't follow. Jack is a man who either smokes or he doesn't. <laughs> and we won't know until we have an explanation by means of an observation that Jack actually smokes. There is no Jack probably smokes. <laughs> and Popper agrees with this, by the way, of course. Popper goes on to explain a whole bunch of things about why it is that some people would endorse that particular second kind of valid to a degree argument. And after some exposition on this point, he says, quote, thus the problem of induction is to be solved by constructing a generalized logic, a logic of probability, end quote. He's steel manning their argument, right? And I would say still people today endorse this kind of thing. He continues, quote, for according to this persuasive argument, inductive logic is nothing but probability logic. It is the logic of uncertain inference, of uncertain knowledge, and the probability of some hypothesis H, given some evidence, is the degree to which our certain knowledge of the evidence rationally justifies our belief in the hypothesis. As I have said before, I believe that this argument is completely mistaken. The appeal to probability does not affect the problem of induction at all. Formally, this may be supported by the remark that every universal hypothesis goes so far beyond any empirical evidence that its probability will always remain zero because the universal hypothesis makes assertions about an infinite number of cases while the number of observed cases can only be finite, end quote. That's marvellous. That's their popper at his best. What we're doing in science when we come up with theories, we come up with, especially in physics, but, you know, chemistry, biology, we're coming up with universal theories, theories that apply to everything at all times and all places. In other words, an assertion about an infinite number of cases but how can we possibly get to that assertion about an infinite number of cases if we can only ever have a finite number of observed cases? Well, that's because we begin with the theory. We don't begin with the finite number of observed cases. It's cart before the horse kind of stuff. This is the great mistake that Popper was addressing and solving. Everyone else was saying, well, look, you begin with the observations. Even today, you begin with the observations. This is the whole point of science. You go out into the world and you observe stuff. And from those observations, you then derive your knowledge. No, that's all ass around. That's all cart before the horse. Put the horse before the cart. And the horse is the theory. You come up with the theory first. You explain what's going on. You conjecture, you use your imagination, your creativity. That's what you are. You're a human being. That's what you're supposed to be doing in the world. It doesn't just mean in science, everywhere. Now, 
having come up with a solution, then you rely upon that solution and you keep on using that solution until one day you come across a problem, which usually means you encounter one of your finite observations, one of your finite observations that disagrees with your prevailing view, your existing theory, what you have thought so far for so long, and that contradicts what you've thought all this time. And so then you're going to have to adapt on the run. You're going to have to create, come up with a new solution. And in science, you're coming up with this explanation that explains everything you've seen so far. It's not being derived from what you've seen. It explains what you've seen and then reaches out from what you have seen and where you are sitting at your desk or in your laboratory to everywhere else in the universe, to things you will never observe, but it will apply to them. In the same way that, let's assume the old wives' tale, the urban legend, the myth that, you know, Newton saw the apple fall from the tree. Let's say he did do that, very questionable, but let's say he did. This is one of the observations. It's not like he took that observation and from that observation of the apple falling derived his universal theory of gravity. No, he came up with the universal theory of gravity which explained the motion of planets across the sky and apples falling and tides going in and out and it reached out from where he was in England across the Earth, throughout the solar system to the other side of the galaxy and the universe. That same law applied Two fruits falling from trees on the surface of planets around stars he would never observe and perhaps no one ever will. This is the thing about science. This is what science does. It begins there with the theory. And then, moving through life with your theory, you encounter a problem. And that problem is often, not always, but often an observation of some kind, especially when it comes to science, it's an observation of some kind that disagrees with your theory for reasons you don't know. Maybe you've just made a mistake in your observation. You think you've made an observation, but in fact you have, and it's something's gone wrong. It's an optical illusion. Who knows what? Your instrument wasn't working. But whatever the case, you've got a problem that you've got to solve. And sometimes that might be very well the beginning of a whole new grand theory of science. Okay, so that's everything that Popper got right. Now, here is where I emphasize things a little differently to Popper. And I'd love to be able to speak to him about what he had in mind. I wish there were examples here, but let me pick it up where he writes, quote, let us turn to that idea, which I believe is defensible. It is the idea that hypotheses may be distinguished according to the results of their tests. The idea that some hypotheses are well tested by experience and others are not so well tested, that there are further hypotheses which so far have not been tested at all, and hypotheses which have not stood up to tests and which therefore may be regarded as falsified. If we look upon a number of hypotheses from this point of view, there can be no objection to grading them according to the degree to which they have passed their tests. Exactly as we may grade students who have undergone a number of tests, some of them easy, some of them difficult. The wish to grade hypotheses according to the tests passed by them is legitimate. I do not know of any serious objection. For reasons to be discussed in the next section, I propose to call the grade of a hypothesis or the degree to which it has stood up to tests its degree of corroboration rather than its probability, end quote. Okay, we can't speak to him now. What a shame. But I just would love to know what he had in mind. Where are these situations where we've got this great spectrum of hypotheses that we need to rank order, that we need to treat like students that we're grading, where we say, here's hypothesis one, and it has a certain amount of corroboration. Here's hypothesis two, that's got slightly more corroboration. And here's hypothesis three, that's got yet more corroboration. This doesn't happen. (laughs) This doesn't happen. On Popper's own account, this doesn't happen. What happens is if you have that situation ever arise, and as I keep on saying, Please write in, email me, tweet me, whatever. A situation where you really do have these actual, different, viable, good explanations of the same phenomena and you can't distinguish between them and so you need corroboration. What really happens is, as we say, and as David Deutsch has pointed out on more than one occasion, including most importantly in his paper on the logic of experimental tests, what you do is you come up with a crucial test, an experiment, which will rule out 
all of the different alternatives, usually only one if you're lucky, all of the different alternatives, leaving only one standing, the one that can explain the results of the experiment. So why Popper wants this degree of corroboration, I don't know. In what specific situation? Now, throughout this chapter, we don't actually get an example, which is a problem. Like, he's right to say that that if you do have competing hypotheses, there's no point in talking about the probability of one over the other. He's got that right. But degree of corroboration, and exactly how would we measure this degree of corroboration? I don't know. The best he can do, uh, in fact, in this section, he says, quote, I shall later give a definition of degree of corroboration, one that permits us to compare rival theories such as Newton's and Einstein's. I doubt whether a numerical evaluation of this degree will ever be of practical significance. End quote. Quite right. <laughs> Quite right. And if there is no such way of providing a numerical evaluation of this degree, what point is it? What point is there in postulating this? His own example, my trope example that I like to use following him, of course, is Newton versus Einstein. Now, there, to be generous to him, I think that maybe what he might be saying, one way of reading him, is just to say that this degree of corroboration is just perfectly synonymous with refuted or not, refuted or not. So either Newton's theory is refuted or it's not refuted. Now, if it is refuted, then you can say, well, Einstein's theory is corroborated by the evidence. I would just prefer to say explains the evidence. It explains the evidence. It explains the evidence better than any rival. In fact, there are no rivals. (laughs) There are no longer any rivals. How can you say there are no rivals? Because we did an experiment, and the only rival that existed up until that point was Newton's theory of gravity. But it couldn't explain the results of this particular experiment. Call it Eddington's experiment. But any number of things these days. Newton's theory can't explain this stuff. So what can? Einstein's theory. Is it well corroborated? Doesn't matter. (laughs) Doesn't matter. Whatever this word corroborated means, it doesn't matter the degree of corroboration. You can say it explains absolutely everything that has been asked of it. Well, maybe not. It can't quite explain what dark matter is. It can't explain what dark energy is. Okay, fine. But nor can anything else. For the stuff that is explicable by general relativity, by Einstein's theory, nothing else can do that job. Nothing else explains precisely why Mercury follows the orbit that it does around the sun. Only one theory does that. But is that theory well corroborated? That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. On the one hand, you can say, yeah, every single time you observe Mercury, that's another corroboration of Einstein's theory of general relativity. But again, degree of corroboration. If tomorrow someone comes up with an explanation for gravity that not only does absolutely everything that Einstein's general theory of relativity does, not only is able to accomplish absolutely everything that the existing theory of gravity does, but also goes a bit further. It is able to solve the problem of what dark matter is. Then we'll be in a situation where we have a theory of gravity that is superior to Einstein's theory of gravity because it can do everything Einstein's theory of gravity can do and it can explain dark matter, and in all likelihood, the history of science suggests that when you have a good explanation, it reaches into areas by postulating the existence of entities hitherto you never even imagined. So in the case of general relativity, it reaches into areas where it postulates things like black holes and big bangs and the curvature of space-time and gravitational lensing and various things that weren't even thought of prior to general relativity. And so whatever the successor is to general relativity, we should expect the same kind of thing. Now, I just want to pick up in this section that I'm reading from a few other gems here that really, they stand the test of time. They're just written so well because Popper at times, because Popper wrote a vast amount, and as I keep on emphasizing, he was writing for his contemporaries. But if you can get through some of the jargon at times, The gems in here are absolutely brilliant. And, well, let me just pick up one. Quote, Every observation, and to an even higher degree, every observation statement, is itself already 
an interpretation in the light of our theories. Yet even though this fact is most important, it raises a minor issue compared with what I wish to criticize here, a general attitude, a general philosophy of science, a philosophy which makes its main problem that of explaining whence science derives its certainty, its rational reliability, its validity, or its authority. For I hold that science has no certainty, no rational reliability, no validity, no authority. The best we can say about it is that although it consists of our own guesses, of our own conjectures, we are doing our very best to test them. That is to say, to criticize them and to refute them. But the inductivist philosophy not only attributes authority to science, it also, perhaps quite unwittingly, attributes to science a cautious and indeed timid approach which is entirely foreign to our real procedure, end quote. And that, of course, is the quote I began this episode with. But isn't it brilliant that Popper there still is a revolutionary of a kind when it comes to epistemology because so many people simply don't understand that and yet reject him out of hand and yet here he is getting straight to the point about the purpose of science and what we're up to what we're doing when it comes to science, and even more broadly than science, testing our own guesses and our conjectures, trying to criticize and refute them. But instead, so many people are fixated on this idea of the authority of something or other, the authority of science. And Popper rejected that. He rejected authority everywhere. Politics, there's moral authorities, political authorities, scientific authorities. Okay, just a little more here. Before we, I know this is going to be an extremely long episode, but just a little more here about corroboration. Section 28, Popper goes on to say, In the foregoing section, I introduced the term degree of corroboration to characterize the degree to which a hypothesis has stood up to tests. In the present section, I intend to discuss merely a terminological issue, my reasons for proposing to speak of degree of corroboration, rather than of the probability of a hypothesis in the light of the tests. My main reason is, of course, that the latter phrase, although in itself perfectly legitimate, is liable to lead to confusion, end quote. So where I disagree is, it's not perfectly legitimate. I don't think there is such a thing as probability of a hypothesis in the light of the tests. I just don't think there's any point of speaking in that way. And his attempt to improve this by saying, well, I'm not going to talk about probability, I'm instead going to talk about corroboration, is a false dichotomy. Both of these approaches, unusually for Popper, can be rejected because of Popper's own best solution, which is what we're doing is ruling out all the other theories left with only one that doesn't need, so we don't need to be concerned about corroboration. We just need to be concerned about Whether or not our theory solves our problem, explains our phenomena, has no other rivals that are yet to be ruled out by experimental tests, which in science, they always are. At least eventually, Popper spends many, many pages criticising, and I think rightly, the whole language of probability to a large extent and the whole application of probability to epistemology He highlights errors, and it's very much worth reading. I'm not going to read through it now. As I say, this is already getting very long, and perhaps I'm losing part of my audience. But let me pick it up where Popper does try to introduce an example. And so where he tries to justify, for want of of another word, his use of this whole concept of corroboration or degree of corroboration. He goes on to say, quote, No rule of content holds for the first sense of probability, which I call degree of corroboration. On the contrary, most physicists will say that Maxwell's theory of light is more probable in the first sense, that is to say, better corroborated or better tested than Fresnel's theory of light. The reason is that Maxwell's theory has been more widely and more severely tested, even in fields in which Fresnel's theory cannot be tested. At the same time, Maxwell's theory has a much greater logical content than Fresnel's. Maxwell's is a wave theory of light and a theory of electromagnetism, while Fresnel's is merely a wave theory of light. Thus, Maxwell's theory, although more probable in the sense of being 
better corroborated or better tested, is at the same time less probable in the sense of the second usage of the word, which is also very well established, especially if we are thinking not so much of the tests successfully passed by a hypothesis, but rather the chances that an event will occur, end quote. Again, <laughs> I think this is all useless. I, I, I don't think that we need to worry about how many you know, counting up how many successfully passed tests a particular hypothesis has managed to pass. If this was the case, if this was the case, then, you know, my mystery about why is it on this view of things being more probable, the more tests they passed, why is it that the day before, the day before Newton's theory of gravity was finally once and for all refuted, by Eddington's experiment. Why was it that that day, apparently, its probability of truth was at its highest because it was that day that it had passed the most tests, thousands, millions of tests perhaps. Every time someone observed anything that could have been explained by Newton's theory of gravity, it was, it was. Newton's theory of gravity had passed all of these tests and not passed some. But apparently, Einstein's theory, which was brand new, had not passed as many tests. It hadn't. It simply hadn't. Not many people had applied it to a to certain problems. Certainly Albert Einstein had, and maybe a few other physicists who understood the theory at the time in 1919. But really, it hadn't been used to solve problems, so it wasn't passing tests. But that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter how many tests it's passed. It can be the best explanation. It can be closer to true, closer to describing reality than any other alternative, including Newton's, which had have passed more tests. This whole idea of corroboration introduces a problem which doesn't need to be solved. The problem would be, well, Newton's theory has been very heavily corroborated by all of these tests that went before. But Einstein's theory had not yet been corroborated. Who cares about corroboration? It's about refutation and explanation. And when we have two competing explanations, we seek a method of refutation, of trying to rule it out. That's exactly what happens. Now, let me go towards the end of this particular section and, and, and finally um, tie up <laughs> loose ends about this. And why, again, I would love to be able to speak to Popper about this because Popper almost admits, <laughs> he almost admits in this very chapter that he's making a mistake. Uh, I'll just read. He says, quote, and th this is coming from page number 228 of Realism and the Aim of Science. He writes, quote, There is, unfortunately, the danger of another terminological confusion. Until recently, in fact, until the logic of scientific discovery was in galley proof, I did not use the term degree of corroboration, but in its place, the term degree of confirmation. And I made use of this term for precisely the same reason, because of the need to avoid the term probability. Therefore, I must now make clear why I have decided to change my terminology after using it in at least half a dozen publications, end quote. Okay, I'm not going to go on with his explanation here about why he's chosen to change tack to using degree of corroboration. He's saying right there that he wants to avoid the term probability. He understands that his own epistemology entails that you can't say things like this hypothesis is probably true and you're not even aiming for something to be probably true or certainly true or anything like that. But despite that, because he feels like he needed to have some replacement for this whole idea of things being more probable, a particular theory being more probable, but he knows that that's a mistake. He knows that that's wrong. He knows that he's not trying to, and our project rather, in science and anywhere else, is not to try and find the most probable theory. That's not what we're trying to do. But he thinks he needs a replacement for that. So at first, in the logic of scientific discovery, at first, his best guess was to say, well, rather than talk about how well, how probable a particular theory is, he's going to talk about the degree of confirmation, how well confirmed a theory is. And now, decades later in writing this book on, on reflection, he's realized, whoa, I shouldn't have been talking about degree of confirmation. We can't confirm our theories or partly confirm our theories or anything like that. He realizes that's wrong. But he still wants something else. He wants corroboration now to fill the void 
But the fact is, there is no void. His own philosophy does away with that whole thing, that whole way of speaking and thinking, this whole idea of this particular theory is more probable, this particular theory is more confirmed or best confirmed, or this theory even has a higher degree of corroboration. I think all of that is not a part of Papirian epistemology. Papirian epistemology is about trying to create good explanations. And if you're lucky, as I've said for about the 10th time in this episode alone, if you're lucky, you might have competing explanations. That's extremely rare. But if you do, then you do what Popper has explained. You come up with the experimental test that rules out all but one. Never mind how probable that theory is. Never mind if it's certain or has some degree of certainty. And never mind if it's been corroborated by repeated observations. That's not important. What's important is whether or not your theory or explanation actually does the job of accounting for those observations, that finite set of observations, and then allows you to infer what is true about the rest of physical reality because you're explaining the rest of physical reality. So your predictions about the rest of physical reality are derived from that explanation, but it's not the other way around. You're not deriving the explanation from the finite set of observations and then predicting that, therefore, that finite set of observations in some way inductively infers or entails that a particular set of observations will continue. In fact, it might say quite the opposite, that the explanation of this particular finite set of observations says that tomorrow they're not going to continue for whatever reason. Okay, I did say I was going to finish there, but I can't. There is a little bit right at the end here of this section on corroboration that well, I have to give Karl Popper the final word. Almost the final word. <laughs> Let's read his conclusion here. And he writes, quote, I conclude this section by giving a summary of my views concerning corroboration in the form of seven points, the first of which contains the fundamental idea. Number one, the degree of corroboration of a theory is an evaluation of the results of the empirical tests it has undergone. End quote. Okay, so that point number one there, I've got no problem with. I mean, he could talk about the degree of corroboration as an evaluation of the results of empirical tests. In other words, it would be a synonym for which theory survives the process of experimental refutation. And if you want to call that degree of corroboration, fine. I think it might be a little bit misleading because we've got this concept of degree. This one has more survived than the other. But it's a black and white thing, isn't it? I mean, if you want to say that on and off is a degree or true and false is a degree <laughs> of truth or falsity, fine. But most people, what they mean by degree is a grey scale, whereas I would say it's black and white. And I think that Popper thinks it's black and white as well, but he's speaking in the language of his opponents. Let's continue. Quote, number two. There are two attitudes, two ways of looking at the relations between a theory and experience. One may look for confirmation or for refutation. These two attitudes are obviously variants of the apologetic or dogmatic and of the critical attitude. Scientific tests are always attempted refutations. Number three. The difference between attempted confirmations and attempted refutations or tests is largely, though not completely, amenable to logical analysis. Four, a theory will be said to be the better corroborated the more severe the tests it has passed and the better it has passed them, end quote. Again, as you probably guess what I'm going to say is that's kind of pointless. When you've got an explanation, either it passes the test or it doesn't, it's very rare to worry about which one is passing more severe tests. You might very well say, okay, we're comparing Newton and Einstein, and Eddington's experiment is a severe test. And in passing that severe test, that is the reason why we endorse that theory and not Newton's theory. But I think it's just a wrong way around of phrasing things. Rather than talk about which one is passing tests... Just talk about which one failed the test. And which one failed the test, never mind severity, which one failed it, was Newton's theory. So, for all practical purposes, discard that theory. 
when you, when it comes to explaining things like the results of Eddington's experiment. You might not discard the theory for a whole bunch of other things like predicting the tides or how fast apples are falling from trees. It could be very useful for that kind of thing. But Popper goes on to say, point five, quote, a test will be said to be the more severe, the greater the probability of failing it, the absolute or prior probability, as well as the probability in light of what I call our background knowledge, that is to say, knowledge which by common agreement is not questioned, while testing the theory under investigation, end quote. Well, there we have a whole lot of stuff about probability. <laughs> the very thing that Popper has said, you know, um, it is is not of much use when it comes to epistemology. But I think he still, of course, thinks, well, probability is this real thing. Unlike with David Deutsch, who basically has concluded, it's all a scam. I mean, real life, as I've explained in other podcasts, doesn't obey the probability calculus. Even gaming machines and roulette wheels and so on and so forth strictly, strictly do not obey the probability calculus. Only approximately so. But approximately so isn't reality and isn't our best explanation. Our best explanation is quantum theory, which says what actually happens. Anyway, let's just continue. Point six, Popper says, quote, Thus, every genuine test may be described intuitively as an attempt to catch the theory. It is not only a severe examination, but as an examination, it is an unfair one. It is undertaken with the aim of failing the examinee rather than the aim of giving him a chance to show what he knows. The latter attitude would be that of the man who wants to confirm or to verify his theory. And seven, assuming always that we are guided in our tests by a genuinely critical attitude and that we exert ourselves in testing the theory, an assumption which cannot be formalised, we can say that the degree of corroboration of a theory will increase with the improbability, in the light of background knowledge, of the predicted test statements, provided the predictions derived with the help of the theory are successful. End quote. Yes, so again, so much here is, as I say, couched in terms of the language dominant at the time, among the people he was trying to explain his philosophy to. And he was having a uphill battle in trying to get these ideas across. This book, written decades after the logic of scientific discovery, and he still, although in objective terms, won the debate, he wasn't winning the debate in academia. The academics didn't accept what he was saying to a large extent. All we need is, to my mind, point two that he said there. You've got two attitudes two ways of looking at the relationship between a theory and experience. Either you can look for confirmation or you can look for refutation. And these things are not symmetrical. The truth is, scientific tests, and indeed all of our critical apparatus, are attempted refutations. And if they fail, that means you just have to rely upon your existing theory. Your existing theory is the best thing you've got in order to try and solve your problem situation and if it can't solve your problem situation you've still got a problem situation so therefore you better get about creating a new theory but this whole scheme of things being probably true things being more or less certain things being corroborated or not is irrelevant and popper doesn't need it and popperian epistemology doesn't need it and as i say in the next episode okay this is sort of an episode in two parts i suppose we will see what David Deutsch has to say about this idea that we can understand Popper's epistemology better than Popper. In the same way, as David will explain, people today can understand Einstein's theories better than Einstein or Darwin's theory of natural selection better than Darwin. Just because these people begin by explaining to us for the first time the theory, we shouldn't expect that they best explain the theory. The theory rightly deserves to be named after them, but that does not mean they have some sort of ownership of it. And in fact, Popper was one of the first to actually say that. Once the theory has been explained, it ceases to be that person's theory. They, don't have, they, they cannot claim any special insight into the theory. Other people can be more insightful about that theory. I'm certainly not claiming that. What I am claiming is that Popper's own explanation of his own theory means that sometimes some of what he said about that theory is kind of redundant. <laughs> I think we need it. But until next time, which should be very soon, I'll release the next one very soon. Bye-bye.